Over the last uh, 20 years or so, I think we've seen an increasing understanding that venous thromboembolism is a serious problem, that uh, it attends high-risk patients who are admitted to hospital, uh, both medical and surgical patients, and that uh, we can identify those who are at the greatest risk, and once we've identified them, we can provide them uh, with methods for preventing thrombosis. Uh, either pharmacological interventions, and the most common to date have been the low molecular weight heparins over that period, which have had a profound effect in terms of reducing the burden of uh, venous thromboembolism in both surgical and acutely ill medical patients. But we now have uh, also the uh, novel oral anticoagulant drugs, which are single targeted agents which uh, uh, can be used to prevent and treat thrombosis. And increasingly, we're using those in patient populations, particularly those discharged from hospital, who remain at risk of developing thrombosis. So venous thrombosis is an important problem. We've also seen major advances in treating established venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, again using the low molecular weight heparins, and moving the focus of treatment uh, from the hospital to the community, which is vitally important in terms of more effectively reducing, uh, utilising hospital resources. On the arterial side, we've seen major advances in the field of coronary artery thrombosis, uh, both in a treatment of acute myocardial infarction and acute coronary syndromes, where antithrombotic therapy is now the mainstay of initial treatment, in addition to, of course, uh, percutaneous coronary intervention, angioplasty and stenting, and then longer-term antiplatelet therapy to reduce uh, recurrent cardiovascular events and to prevent stent thrombosis. And we've seen a, an increasing focus now, again with the novel oral anticoagulant drugs, on the problem of thromboembolic stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation. And this is an important problem because healthcare systems around the world recognise that um, stroke is a major burden for society and for the individual patient. And these novel anticoagulant drugs, certainly from the excellent phase three studies for a number of them, suggest that they're going to provide important advantages, certainly for moderate and high risk patients, to be prevented or to have prevention against potential stroke. And I think the, the world has quite a lot to learn from the National Health Service because in 2000, um, a national service framework for cardiovascular disease was established and led by Sir Roger Boyle, cardiologist in this country, who was appointed the cardiac czar. And he initiated a program after broad consultation, bringing together different stakeholders, clinicians, the healthcare system, patients, carers, etc and was able to focus both on primary prevention and improved treatment for those with established disease. And that strategy had a target of reducing cardiovascular deaths by 40% and achieved that very rapidly within a short number of years. And that took both a public health approach, so targeting smoking, targeting fat intake, uh, improved uh, lifestyle, more physical activity, but also ensuring that what we knew from excellent clinical research and outcomes research was applied in routine everyday clinical practice, uh, such as ensuring that uh, patients at risk uh, of recurrent cardiovascular events or primary cardiovascular disease were given appropriate drugs such as statins, uh, that we had a bigger focus on measuring uh, blood pressure and ensuring that that was properly controlled. So there is no doubt that uh, from a public health point of view, a systems-based approach that looks both at individual patients but at populations at risk can achieve important outcomes in terms of reducing events uh, such as mortality associated with cardiovascular disease. It's a very important question and certainly one that all uh, mature and in fact developing healthcare systems are looking at. Again, if we look at the National Health Service, the chief executive of the NHS undertook an innovation review uh, which has resulted in the recommendation that in England uh, the NHS establish academic health science networks, networks where academic institutions, health service providers, um, those who commission health care, uh, local authorities which will have a greater responsibility for well-being and population health, come together to ensure that uh, the entire resource of the NHS can be properly focused to promote health and also to promote wealth to ensure that the great opportunities for working with industry in a responsible way to improve the uh, volume and quality of clinical research that's undertaken in our country uh, and to ensure that once the findings of those research, that research has been properly established, 
uh, properly reviewed by the National Institute for Clinical Excellence appears in guidelines, that those guidelines can be effectively implemented across healthcare systems to ensure uh, that the maximum number of patients benefit. So that's one important area uh, of working together. But in clinical research, we also recognise that the important investments that industry can make in collaborative studies have a huge impact on delivering important programmes of research that can generate very meaningful uh, data and new knowledge that can help inform the discussion that takes place in the clinical community about how best to manage patients. And here I think that uh, we have to look both at the valuable investment in phase three uh, clinical research, which is vitally important, early stage clinical research, that early discovery research in phase one and phase two, to look at new molecules and new agents and get them quickly uh, to be evaluated in man in a targeted fashion to understand which patient populations are going to benefit from uh, these new interventions in a most effective fashion. But also longer term outcomes research in the real world, understanding how when we bring new innovations into clinical practice, uh, we determine in the real world rather than in the clinical trial setting, if they're achieving the benefits that we assume they would achieve from the initial research. And, uh, we're involved in a very interesting piece of work, the Garfield Registry, which is a large outcomes programme in patients with atrial fibrillation, where over the a period of five cohorts, some six or seven years, we're going to look at 55,000 patients newly diagnosed with atrial fibrillation and prospectively followed to determine how all this innovation in terms of trying to prevent stroke is being applied in the real world. And what we've decided to do is to go uh, to 30 countries at the moment around the world and randomly select sites in primary care, in hospital practice, in anticoagulant clinics, cardiologists, neurologists, etc. And therefore include in this piece of research sites that wouldn't normally be involved in research and ask them to register their patients within six weeks of diagnosis and then follow them for a number of years to see what are the outcomes in the real world and all this marvellous research that's being done, how is it being applied and is it really impacting and, reduce, and reducing individual burden and society's burden through uh, preventing stroke? I think it will. I think what we're starting to understand now is if we're going to re uh, use uh, the valuable resources that the healthcare systems and the state make available for healthcare, we need to be much more thoughtful about understanding the challenges we face. And the great challenge we face is an aging population with more chronic disease. And that impacts hugely on the occurrence of cardiovascular disease and cancer and mental health problems and so on. So what we need to be able to do is at the initiation stage of the research programs, understand whether the interventions we are providing can be targeted to specific subpopulations of those broad groups of people at risk or, or with established uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, and therefore better biomarkers, better risk characterization and profiling, and then applying a specific targeted ter therapy to those populations will provide an important opportunity. And I think the real world outcomes research provides us the opportunity to better profile populations who have established disease and understand what characteristics uh, drove them to develop that particular form of disease. I, I think it's vitally important that there's transparency and that there's absolute probity in the uh, conduct uh, of collaborative research. And I think that all data needs to be shared uh, and data needs to be well understood because there are important challenges to uh, conducting medical research. But most of all, all healthcare and all research is about the patient. And therefore, if the focus is always what's in the best interest of our patients, uh, then I think we have a common place, a common set of values that allow effective collaboration to be conducted. You know, research is about our patients. Ultimately, medical research is to ensure that those people who uh, develop a disease are able to avail themselves of the best treatments and that as a population in society, uh, we are able to identify those uh, at risk of developing diseases and help prevent it.